Before reading an excerpt from my anthology on the Nazi Holocaust, I wanted to offer a few words of introduction. One of the most frightening things we saw during the beginning weeks of the Trump administration was the vandalizing of Jewish centers, synagogues, and cemeteries, with little, if any, outcry from the White House. Anti-Semitism, or prejudice against Jews, was the basis of these deplorable acts and was also the basis of the most horrific outcome of such prejudice, that is, the Nazi Holocaust. The genocide perpetrated in Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators from 1933 to 1945, during which time over six million Jews and millions of others were systematically murdered. In 1972, after I began teaching in the History Department at Monument Mountain Regional High School in Great Barrington, then Department Chair Jack Spencer said he thought it was a serious error on the part of history textbooks that in the chapters on World War II, there was only one line about this genocide. So Spencer and the Department spent a summer creating what was to be the first curriculum on this subject for high school students in the country. And out of this curriculum came an anthology that Spencer and I co-edited entitled, Can It Happen Again? Chronicles of the Holocaust. One of the six questions we posed in our study was, who were the perpetrators of this evil? And were they mad? One explanation of the Nazis' behavior has been that Hitler and his followers were indeed insane. To explore that question, we included in the anthology an excerpt from a July 1976 Psychology Today article entitled, Were Hitler's Henchmen Mad? by Molly Harrower in which she describes a study of Nazi war criminals that suggests that, in fact, they were not. Wrote Harrower, it was easy to believe in 1945 that Hitler's henchmen were mad. It seemed impossible, for example, that Albert Speer, Hitler's confidant, Reich Minister for Armaments and War Production, and the man personally responsible for enslaving millions, could have been anything but insane, a maniac. The lesson Hitler and the Nazis taught us seemed simple. Keep insane people out of high office, and the atrocities of the Third Reich will never happen again. Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. The Nazis who went on trial at Nuremberg were as diverse a group of people as one might find in our own government today, or for that matter, in the leadership of the PTA. In 1945, the Nazi war criminals took the Rorschach inkblot test while they awaited trial. The Rorschach is a series of 10 cards with ink blue blocks with some black and white, some blobs of red, blue, and yellow. The person being tested looks at each card and describes what the ink blot looks like to him. The ink blots are not intended to look like anything, so there is no right or wrong answer as there is to say the IQ test. The idea behind the Rorschach technique is that when a person describes what he sees, he reveals aspects of his personality, particularly his unconscious needs and desires. In 1947, 10 Rorschach experts, including myself, that's referring to the journalist Harrower, received copies of the Nazi Rorschach answers and were asked to comment on them. Although all of us agreed to respond, not one of us followed through. I was vice chairman of the committee that initiated this project, so my own failure to participate was particularly puzzling to me. Over the years, I've come to believe that our reason for not commenting on the test results was that they did not show what we expected and what the pressure of public opinion demanded that we see, that these men were demented creatures, as different from normal people as a scorpion is from a puppy. What we saw was a wide range of personalities from severely disturbed neurotics to the superbly well-adjusted. But only Douglas Kelly, the Nuremberg psychiatrist who interviewed the Nazis, said aloud in 1946, quote, that such personalities are not unique or insane and could be duplicated in any country of the world today, unquote. These results do not excuse the acts of the Nazis. Instead, they demonstrate that well-adjusted people may get caught up in a tangle of social forces that makes them goose step their way towards such abominations as the calculated execution of six million Jews and the systematic elimination of the elderly and other, quote, unproductive people. 
It may be comforting to believe that the horrors of World War II were the work of a dozen or so insane men. But it is a dangerous belief, one that may give us a false sense of security. And she finishes her article with this line. It can happen here. And many of us would say it is happening here, right now, and with great consequences to our beloved arts, among so many other victims.